talk over is stationarity and unit root tests. So stationarity just means, does, does the time series go somewhere? And does it move away from its, from its, let's say, from its starting point, and can it end up somewhere very far away or a different, in, a, in a different position? Um, normally, when you look at log returns, you see the plots of the log returns. They're, they're centered close to zero, and they move positive or negative. And if your time series is a time series of returns, it's a long difference. And normally, that series is, is stationary. It doesn't go anywhere. Okay? If you look at the original price series, it starts off at a certain price, and it, it moves, and it could go up. Okay? So the level of the price is not stationary. It's, it's going somewhere. Okay? Um, so we're going to look at co-integration in the second lecture today. And what co-integration does is it tests for um, non-stationary series. So if you look at the original price series, they go somewhere. Um, Co-integration is, is a measure of the relationship between two series that go somewhere. And I'll get into that in more, in more detail later. But we're going to look at some ETFs for um, the MSCI Australian ETF and the MSCI Canadian ETF. Um, and we're going to test for a co-integrated relationship between those two. So both of those are commodities-based economies, um, and you might ex expect some kind of relationship to how well their, their stock indices are doing um, if, if the companies in those indices are driven by uh, commodity returns. <coughs> so an overview, um, so non-stationary means a series goes somewhere. Um, so as I said here, it's moving away from its initial point. We're going to go through the different types of processes in, uh, of financial returns that lead to that later on. Um, Co-integration between two series, they're both non-stationary, so they both go somewhere, and they have some kind of a long-run relationship. So that's a relationship where, if you look at the returns, it might not show okay, in a linear regression. <coughs> So the idea with co-integration is that they're both they're both non-stationary, but you can you can come up with a combination of the two, um, and the residuals of that is to, you know uh, should be um, should have a, a non-unit root. Okay, so a linear combination of the two series is stationary. Okay. So an example of co-integration is a man walking his dog, okay? So when you take your dog for a walk, you leave your house, and the distance between you and your dog is zero. You're both at the same, you're at the same place at the same time, okay? You go for a walk, and the dog and you can get separated. So the dog might go off around a field, or he might go, you know, off into somebody else's house or whatever, or a garden. But at the end of the walk, you both end up back at your house and you're in the same place. So there's a relationship that ties you to the dog. Even though the two of you move apart, and the distance between you can vary, um, there's a relationship that ties, that ties the two of you together. Okay? And the same thing happens in financial markets. So I have a little video here um, of a man walking his dog. Okay. <laughs> which I'm going to show you in a park. <laughs> Obviously, very far from each other, but sooner or later they came back together. 
because the, the you know if you looked at, at their position over time they both they both moved all in different directions and um, the distance between them at the start and the distance between them you know at the finish was was basically um, was zero okay so an example of that you know what what tied them together obviously is the relationship between the owner and the dog. But in financial markets, uh, there's other relationships. So the underlying spot or the price of a share and the price of its future, uh, they, they also should be strongly related to each other. But because they're different markets, they can move apart uh, in one market from the other, but sooner or later they're going to come back together. Okay, So people are going to act um, and they're going to trade in such a way that the two of them are kept and the relationship is maintained between them. So that's what that's what co-integration tests um, are are testing for. <clears throat> so this is an example of the um, a comparison of the two indices. The Canadian uh, index is the red one, and the Australian one is the blue one. <clears throat> um, so you can see that you know day to day, if you looked at the daily returns on them. They're not necessarily moving in the same direction. Okay, so even if you look here, for example, uh, the Canadian index is down, whereas the Australian one is going up there. Okay, so if you looked at a daily difference and you ran a regression of the returns on each other, you might not see a relationship that ties the two of them together. Okay, um, but if you look if you look at the difference between the two series or the difference between a linear combination of the two series. So these have been scaled so that they're on the same, um, they're on the same scale. So actually, uh, you can see here, for example, the, 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 the Australian index is at 24 and the Canadian one is at 30. The Yahoo plot to compare them, it makes them both start at the same level, okay? So it has scaled one of them such that the two of them have the same level here at the start. <coughs> okay. so. That's what a linear combination of the two means. Um, you basically, if you, if you scale them so that they're on the same scale, and you were to subtract the Australian one from the Canadian one there, you'd see that the difference between the two of them is, is quite large at points, but it, it, it narrows, okay? And then it goes the opposite direction, then it narrows, and then it goes in the opposite direction. So <clears throat> the difference between the two of them is, is sort of getting wider and then coming back to zero um, and then it's going the other way and it's coming back to zero and then it happens again okay. so if you look at the difference between the two of them it's stationary it's not going anywhere it's trying to get away but then it gets pulled back okay the difference between the two of them and it gets pulled back to zero all the time and that's a co-integrating relationship it's where the some linear combination of the two of them when you scale them to be on the same plot, the difference between the two of them isn't allowed to get away. It isn't allowed to continuously grow. Um, it gets reset to zero. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a plot from EVs, and it's just pointing out, this is actually the Australian index here. The one we saw on Yahoo Finance had scaled that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Yeah, they've both been scaled basically to be on the same, um, to be on the same scale, okay? And that's what a linear combination means. And then you can look at the difference between the two of them, which is the gap between these two. Okay, if you actually looked at the original without doing a linear combination, there's a larger constant gap between the two original indexes. <coughs> Okay, so why do we care about stationarity? Um, can everyone, would I lower the mic or can everybody read that? Is it okay as it is? Okay, I'll leave it. Um, if, if, if two variables are non-stationary, in other words, they, they both move up, like for example, you know, stock index and stock, on average, the return is gonna be positive or the expected return is gonna be positive. They might be volatile over time, 
but they will both move up. Um, you know, there'd be recessions, etc. but people wouldn't invest if the overall expectation was a drop. So, in general, financial assets or, or stock, you know, uh, share prices or ind indices prices, they move up, okay? So, if you, if you test between two non-stationary variables, you can get what's called a spurious relationship between them. They both happen to be going up at the same time. So, it doesn't mean that one is related to the other. Um, you know, so if you look at population, Norway population is growing, um, and then you looked at an, at an index, a share index, um, <clears throat> that's also growing. You might get a strong relationship between the two of them in the level, whereas they may not actually, one may or may not be influencing the other. It's just a coincidence that they're both moving in the same direction. And all of the, the statistical tests that we do in our linear regression are no longer valid um, if you're dealing with non-stationary um, time series. <clears throat> okay, so the standard assumptions for our analysis will not be valid. So the t-ratios will not follow a t-distribution. So when you get a, when you divide a parameter value by its standard error, and um, that ratio, you can no longer interpret it in the same way that we put it before, where you say a, per, a, a particular level means you've got 95% confidence or whatever. You no longer look at the table based on the t-distribution to, to, to see what the critical values are. <clears throat> so you can't, you can't actually undertake hypothesis tests and you can't say how confident you are about the parameters. Um, okay. So if we generate a lot of un, you know, random non-stationary variables, like you know, things that basically um, just go up, or um, there's no there's no fixed relationship between them, and then we run the regressions of them on each other, um, and you do that a thousand times, you find that you know you get a very high um, you get quite quite high or squared values, um, even though they're not related to each other. One doesn't cause the other, or it looks like one of the series explains the other one just randomly by chance because they both happen to be moving in the same direction. Okay, and that's because that's because they're non-stationary. Um, and this is the same the same thing um, if you run if you ran a thousand regressions uh, and you looked at the the, the t ratio of the, the betas, for example, you would get a lot of them that are very high even though these were just randomly generated data sets, um, because they're non-stationary. <coughs> they just look like they have a relationship by chance. So that's why you have to check when you run a regression, you need to check, um, are your variables non-stationary before you, you know, can validly report the results. <coughs> so there's various ways of testing for non-stationarity. Um, so, two of the models that are commonly used to, to represent financial prices um, or returns, one of them is uh, a random walk model with a drift. So the return, for example, on a, a stock, it, it's some, it has some expected value in mu. So you know, mu could be 10% on average or something. So you, um, so you basically, you get a return um, on, your, on your, your time series for the, for the stock. So when you're looking at the, the stock price, <coughs> and you're looking at basically Y here, uh, and this is time this way. So you're expecting Y to go up over time which is why you invest in it. Um, and if you pick a particular time, like t is equal to one, the price could be at a certain value, then at time two, you would expect it to be the previous value, this one, so you start at that one, okay, and then you add the u, okay, and then you add another component, which is a, a randomly distributed component. It could be either positive or negative onto that, okay. And that's the, that's the u of t. And that's a standard model for stock prices. So you can see that it's actually going somewhere because you've got a mu here which is always added from one, from one period to the next. There's some expected return. 
So even though the price has got a random component, um, over time you'd expect it to, to go up or to, to trend upwards. Okay. The other model there is a deterministic trend process. So um, it doesn't depend on the previous value of itself. It depends on beta times t. Okay. So let's say beta was 1. At time 1, beta times t would also be 1. Um, at time 2, beta times t would be 2. So you'd basically have a line, okay, um, <clears throat> which, which was given by beta t. Then you could also add an intersect to that line, which is alpha, and then you add a random term to that line, which is the u of t. Okay, so it doesn't move directly in a line. So that's a deterministic trend process. And you see, you see trend processes more in economics. So there's more trends in e economic variables um, rather than in stock prices. But you do see trends in, also in, uh, in asset prices. Um, but they, they, for example, in a bubble, the, um, the dot-com bubble, you know, the, the market trend is strongly upwards. <clears throat> but bubbles tend to burst. So you, know, you, you very rarely see a continuous trend that lasts. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a non, um, sorry, this is a stationary process here. So white noise, and, and this is what your residuals are supposed to look like when you run a regression. Um, and you can see they don't go anywhere, they stay around zero. They're average on zero, they're positive or negative on a particular uh, day to the time sample, but they stay around zero. Okay. This is a random walk with a drift, which is the first one that I was trying to draw there. Um, and you can see there's numerous different paths or ways that you know the um, the asset price can wander around, but it has a, it has a positive drift. So um, most of the paths will end up positive, depending on the, the, the size of the the new term relative to the standard deviation of your noise. But if you wait long enough, you know the majority of the paths will be positive, and they will go away from zero. <coughs> And that's a deterministic trend process. Okay, so you can see you could draw a straight line through that, which is basically, in this case, the alpha is zero. And you've got a line that's beta times the time. And then you've got a bit of a noise component on top of that. But you, know, you can see it's, it's almost a straight line. So those are the different types, um, the main different types of non-stationary series that you get in financial um, applications. So you need to know those and be able to briefly describe what they are. <clears throat> okay, so we also saw um, we saw that when we looked at the ARMA models and auto regressive models, uh, basically you have you know a series and it's equal to five times an area value of the series. And if phi is less than one, the series doesn't go away. Or, or sorry, the, the series, you know, um, the, the effect of a shock disappears over time, and the series doesn't, doesn't take, take off, okay? But if phi is equal to one, the series will move, um, and it will get away, it'll get away from its original value. So when we test for a unit root, we're testing for that phi value being one. So if y of t is equal to y of 5 times y of t minus 1, y of t minus 1, plus some noise term, what we're testing is, is this 1, this value? Um, and that, that will catch the type of non-stationary processes that we described before. So in finance, even though there's, there's all sorts of, um, all sorts of different values of phi that could be greater than one, none of them are considered plausible normally. So the test is nearly always to test if phi is equal to one. Okay. So is phi equal to one? And if it is, that's what's called the unit root. And there's, a, there's basically a test for that, which is you know, running a regression to see um, what the value of phi is. OK. Um, so there's just a definition on this slide. So we saw here that if you, if you first difference these, so let's say the, the, um, 
let's say it has a unit root, and if you if you got the if you first difference these, so you got the difference between y of t and y of t minus one, and you tested that, um, that would be stationary, okay? Or if you got the log of the first distance difference, that would be stationary because all you have left on the right hand side then would be this normally distributed uh, residual term. So if you difference something once and it becomes stationary, um, then you say it's i of one, okay? <clears throat> so it's integrating of order one. Um, imagine there was a y of t minus two in there as well. Um, you would have to difference it twice. You'd have to difference the y of t twice through time for it to become stationary. And then you'd say it's integrated of order two, and it would be i of two, okay? So normally when we test um, for co-integration, we just test for, our, for the, the i of one there. And, and if, that's, um, if that's significant, then it means that the, the series is non-stationary, okay? which is one of the requirements when you're testing for co-integration. <coughs> Okay, so you've got i of 0, i of 1, and i of 2 series. Um, so, yeah, the i of 2 needs a difference of twice to make it stationary. Um, i of 1 and i of 2 series, they can wander a long way from their mean value. Um, and they cross the mean rarely, okay? So let's say we took the average of this price um, over time, and it's just in the middle. So. In this case, you know, it's, it's crossed it here a couple of times. It's crossed the mean a few times, but not that often. If you look at these returns, the daily returns, they're crossing the mean of zero all the time, almost every day probably, or, or you know, a lot of the time. Um, so that's an i of zero, integrated of order zero, because it's stationary, um, and this is integrated of order one. And it, it basically doesn't cross its mean value at all. It can get away from its mean value. <coughs> okay, so the majority of economic and financial series have a single unit root. Um, some are stationary, and consumer prices have been argued to have two unit roots. So how would you test for a unit root? So I mentioned already, we're basically testing, is this y value equal to 1? So when you regress something on a previous, um, a previous level of itself, do you, get a, do you get a phi value of 1 in that regression? So that would just be the coefficient, like a beta in, in the regressions like we run. Um, and you're testing whether it's 1 or, or, or not 1. Okay. So, the null hypothesis is that the series has a unit root and that phi is 1, and the alternative is that the series is stationary. And so usually, you use this regression. You wouldn't run the original regression, um, you run this, this regression. Okay? So I mentioned before that when series um, are not stationary, you've got problems with your statistical inference and your t-stats and everything. So, you know, that would explain why you might not run this original regression here, okay? Because, you know, if, if, they're non, if, if there's a unit root, they're not stationary, and actually your phi value here, you can't interpret it correctly, just running that null regression. So that's why you run um, a difference in delta y of t on a lagged version of y of t, okay? <clears throat> and instead of testing that phi is one in this case, you're testing this psi value is equal to zero. Okay. Um, so the name of these tests are called Dickey Fuller tests. Um, and again, we're, we, you'll see in the lab, you can run them in EVs very easily. Okay? And whenever you're testing for co-integration, you run one of these tests first to make sure that you know all, all the series are um, non-stationary that you're you're working with. <coughs> So in addition to, um, to having a unit root, um, often people add in, um, they add to this, to this test. So they, they add in, they assume another type of a model. Okay, so we mentioned before uh, 
um, about the Ram and Walk model. So to test for that, you can just add in a new term here, which is normally referred to as a drift. <coughs> um, and then you can also um, add in a, a trend uh, to your process. And to add a trend into your process, you just add in a lambda times t. So basically, um, you know, if you, if you have a thousand days of data, for the first day, um, that t value is one, for the last day it's a thousand, and it's increasing across your sample. Um, and you're, you're going to include that as a variable, and you're testing uh, for the lambda coefficient on that. But you don't have to do that, it's done automatically in views in this test, okay, when you run it. So what you do in views, I'll show you later, is you run the test, and you're testing then the output from the, this regression, um, and you're, you're testing the significance of the parameters on it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you see if it's possible to reject the null hypothesis that there's a unit root or not. Okay. So this is basically an EV is what you would run. Um, you know, if you if you pick this, if you pick a series, you can you can click on it, right click on it, and you can run a, a unit a unit test on it. And these are the results. Um, so it's testing the null hypothesis that the series has a unit root. Um, if the probability was zero here, it would mean there's zero probability that it has a unit root. Because it's got a high probability, um, you can't reject the null hypothesis that there's a unit root. Okay? So this fails to reject the null hypothesis that there's a unit root. So this test is saying that um, you, you have got a unit root in your data. And what you do to get rid of it is that you do basically what we did even in the first, um, in the first lab. If you, take, if you get log returns of your data, instead of using the level or the price level, that should remove the, the unit root. Um, and that new series should be stationary. So really, most of the time, if you look at regressions, they're normally run on a difference term. They're not run on a level term. And when people do run, you can run regressions on a level term. Um, but when you do, you have to be very, very careful. Um, uh, because all of the statistics that are reported about the coefficients are questionable. <clears throat> OK. Um, so this basically, it also added in a trend on an intercept term which was the mu and the lambda t in, in those uh, equations earlier. And you can see if those are significant or not. So the intercept was, but the trend wasn't. Okay. Um, and the lagged version of the time series was very significant. So that's where the unit root comes from. Okay. <clears throat> OK, so this is how you do a log difference in E-views. So we did it in Excel, in that, in that first um, Excel spreadsheet I put up. There was an index, index level, and then we had the log returns. And this is how I calculated the log returns. It was the log of today's value divided by yesterday's value. And you can type that in in E-views also. Okay? And you, you can create a log difference return and use that. So instead of doing it in Excel, you can do it in E-views. Okay, so we rerun what, what, what I've done here is to create the log difference and rerun the test on the log difference to see does it have a unit root. Okay, and you can see now the probability is very low, so you can reject the null. You can reject the null of the unit root. Okay, when you got the log difference in the series. So the only difference between the two was that I got the log difference. The first one was the price level of the index, and the second one was the log returns of the index. And when, when we used the log returns instead of the price, we didn't have a unit root anymore. We got rid of it. Okay. Um, so that's fine. You would say, why don't we just do log returns all of the time um, instead of using the level, you know, when there's issues with the level and all. And what we're going to cover in the second lecture is that there's some relationships that you can't detect when you use log returns. So this type of relationship, a long-run relationship, it's basically just going to give you a beta of zero because the difference between the two of them um, on average is zero. Okay. 
So what it means by a long run relationship is that sometimes if you look at things in the long run, you don't see a relationship that's there. Okay? You, miss, you miss a relationship that's there. Okay? Um, and, and that's where you would, you would use a co-integration test. So how would you trade something like this? If one of these is, is a Canadian index and the other is a, an Australian index, how would you trade it? So if one of them was lower on a scaled version and the other one went higher, you know they're going to come back together. Okay? So you'd sell the high one and you'd buy the low one. And basically you would, you would, you would have a return that depended on the signal high minus low. Um, and that's going to have some value here. And you know it's going to collapse to zero. The difference is going to collapse to zero. And when it does, you'll gain either this one will increase or this one will decrease. Okay? And if you sell the one that decreases, you make a profit. If you buy the one that increases, you make a profit. Either way, you're guaranteed to, to pocket the difference between the two. So this here would be the best point to get into that trade, um, where the gap between the two of them is the widest, and basically <coughs> you're you're shorting that gap, and you're going to make you're going to make that gap when it goes back to zero. And okay. um, now the issue with this trading strategy um, is that who's to say that the relationship doesn't break down or doesn't change? So really, when you look at it over a long period, this might have happened once before they moved apart, they came back together. It happened twice, they moved apart, they came back together. It happened the third time, they moved apart, and they came back together. But then, this could happen. This one could, go, could break through and keep going that way. This one could keep going that way. And actually, you're losing the gap between the two of them in your trade. You know, the relationship could break down. It used to be that there was a relationship between the two indices. But it's no longer there. Um, and you're after trading it as if it was still there. So that's a risk that you take all the time with these uh, pairs trading strategies. <coughs> Just because a relationship shows up in the data it doesn't mean that it's going to persist into the future. <coughs> Even if it is statistically significant, it could be statistically significant historically, it could still break down. Something could change. You know, there could be a new government in one of the countries, or they could change, you know. The, Anything could change. There could be new uh, import or export uh, regulations, or you know, anything could happen. Um, you know, Australia would export a lot of things to China. Maybe they could fall out, Australia and China, or something. You know, <laughs> who knows? You just you don't know. So, just because relationships exist in the back in the in history, it doesn't mean they're going they're going to continue going forward. <clears throat> okay. So in this case, uh, we can reject the we can reject the null when we use the law differences. Of, of a unit root. <coughs> so there's an augmented Dickey Fuller test then, um, and basically all that does is it, it adds in lags of this difference term, this delta y of t. Um, it, adds, it adds in lags of that through time. Okay? If you don't do that, your, your residuals will be autocorrelated. Um, if, if, if this relationship exists and you don't include it in the model, then what's going to happen is, you know, if you delete this term, the term is going to move into the residuals here, and there'll be autocorrelation in your residuals, which violates the assumptions of the CLRM, and again, your statistical inference will be incorrect, and your, you know, your confidence intervals, your T ratios, P values, they'll all be incorrect. So you, um, you, that's why you have to test your residuals when you run a regression. If they're autocorrelated, maybe you're leaving out a term like this. Okay. Um, so the ADF test is just including lags as well uh, in, in, in the test for a unit root. <coughs> okay. Um, so how many lags do you do you include? Um, again, you can use information criteria, like we did for the ARMA models, like we did for the GART models. Um, you can just randomly um, not randomly, but methodically add in lags and then pick the ones with the best information criteria. And um, luckily, that's, that's built into e -foods. Okay, so. Um. 
when you see the maximum number of lags here and you put in 10 in EVUs, it's, it's doing an ADF and it's adding in up to 10 lags and it's going to pick the best number based on information criteria. And here we've specified to use the Schwartz info criteria um, to, to automatically select the lag length in that ADF. Okay. Instead of ticking that box, <coughs> you could have just specified your own number of lags and said, oh, I know that, I know that more than two lags is not, is not possibly uh, significant or it's not you know, some theoretical reason. I want to do it my own way. I don't want to use information criteria. You could do that as well. Okay, so there's some criticism of these tests because um, we very, very narrowly defined what, a, what, a, um, what we're testing for and that we're testing for a unit root. Um, so the tests, they're, they're, quite, they're quite poor um, at deciding what phi is, whether it's one or, for example, if it was close to one, what if it was 90.95 or 1.05? Um, it's not good at differentiating between those. Um, so, you know, maybe you don't have a unit root, okay? you just have a very high phi value, but it's still not one. So, in theory, um, the series should come back. Okay, so shots to the ser to the to the um, shots should decay over time, very slowly, but they will eventually decay. So the series should come back and it should be stationary, but it's very close to the borderline of being non-stationary. And these type of tests, they're not good at differentiating between that. Um, so you can also use a stationarity test as well as the unit root test that we looked at. <coughs> Okay, um, so does anybody have any questions on that? No? It's all clear, is it? You know, what's, you know the difference between stationary and non-stationary? Yeah. Okay, and the unit root test, you're literally just testing if this is more. If, if when you regress it on itself, delayed by one, if, if the coefficient is one on that, okay, and whether or not that one is is significant. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to start start the second lecture now, and then I'll take a break in five minutes. So I already introduced co-integration, um, and the first thing you do when you're testing for co-integration um, is that you test that the, the the variables are not I0, okay? so they're not stationary, they should be non-stationary, so they should be I1. Um, but in general terms, they, you know, the non-stationary series, they could be I of 2, like you know, they mentioned consumer prices before, or they could be I of 3, or they could be up higher. Okay? So in this case, it's listed up to, up to K. Most of the time we're looking at I, I1. Okay, so there's, some, there's just some um, terminology here. So we say they're co-integrated um, <clears throat> if all of the components are, are I of D. Okay, so um, let, let's just take the example of D being 1. So they're integrated of order of one, all of the original series. So in our case, we're looking at EWA and EWC. They're both I of one. Okay, so they're non-stationary. They, they move away, and, and the, the unit root, you've got a, a phi value of one here. <coughs> um, and then basically it's saying that you can find a coefficient. Okay, so if we took EWA, and we subtracted, uh, in this case he's, he's saying a value alpha. If we subtracted alpha times EWC from that, you would get a stationary time series. And that's what I've done here. So the alpha times EWC is just, it's putting the two time series on the same scale. Okay, 
okay? So we saw that one of them maybe was at 24 and the other was at 32. So the one that's at 24, you multiply it by 32 over 24, okay, to get them on the same scale. So um, you multiply it by 1.33 to get it up to the same level. Then you subtract it from the other one. And that's what gives you this signal here, okay, when you subtract it from the other one. <coughs> And this signal here is stationary. It's not going anywhere. It keeps coming back to zero. Um, so based on that, even though we haven't done a, a statistical test on it, based on that, we'd say those two indices look like they could be co-integrated. There's a linear combination of them um, that's stationary. It doesn't get away from zero in this case. Okay. <coughs> Okay, um, so this is just a number of different ways of saying that same thing. So what, what, what if they weren't co-integrated? Okay. Then you wouldn't be able to create a linear combination of them that, um, that was stationary. So if you subtracted the Canadian index from the Australian one, the difference wouldn't keep going back to zero in that case. Maybe the difference would would go somewhere um, between the two of them. Okay. So here the difference is um, it's gone positive in this case, and then it's going negative, and then it's going positive, but it keeps coming back to zero. Okay. If the difference between the two of them, if there was no linear combination of the two of them that was stationary, this signal might go off somewhere. Okay. You wouldn't be able to get it to, to be stationary and to stay around zero. And in that case, you'd say there's no longer a relationship between the Canadian and the Australian index. <coughs> and doing a pairs trade of the spread between the two of them uh, wouldn't be a good idea then, because maybe this is random. You don't know whether it's going to be positive, whether it's going to be negative. OK. Um, the notation here assumes that actually you've got more than two variables. So you know, let's say we had a, we had a, a matrix of world indices. You've got Australia, Canada. Um, the US, the UK, some European index, an emerging markets index, whatever. And you want to test for co-integrating relationships between, between all of them. Um, that's why there's, a, there's, there's more than one variable in this notation. Okay? And in that case, you can have more than one co-integrating relationship um, between all of them. So does everybody understand that? Okay, so I'm going to take a break there, um, and I'll come back in about 10 minutes. Uh, to, to